Now, the title of this talk is How become a Scientist Becomes an Astronaut. And that's basically very simple. The flight that was planned was a combination of the shuttle and the space lab. And the space lab was, had about 18 different experiments in there. Three of them were classical experiments. And NASA decided at some point it is more cost effective to train a scientist that knows the ins and outs of crystal growth to, be, to train to do an astronaut and, and, uh, than it is to take an astronaut and try to train that person in all the crystal growth science and so on. So then you go and you go and Asa comes and says, are you interested in doing that? And in the beginning you say, oh why not, let me put in that group that they are going to select from, and I'm so old and I have bad eyes and this, so the first selection step, I'm out of it. But at least it makes a good impression on NASA, I'm interested. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so then what happened was, next selection step, I was still in, next selection step, I was still in, then you go to the NASA physical and never ever compare complain about your physical, okay? That's a three-day physical, and you never have to wait for the doctor. The doctor waits for you. And so you are bouncing after another by itself. That exam is a burden to speak, to remember. Now, I was still in. And so the next step I know is I was the prime crew member for the experiments. And that really is how it happened. Now, going in space represents a certain amount of risk. Actually, a large amount of risk. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you have to imagine that. Here is these astronauts usually are very rational people. They think with their mind. And so, there you go, and you get seated on top of a big rocket with about two and a half million kilograms of high explosives. And then you turn around and you tell the people on the ground, fire it up. <laughs> okay. and, and so what drives it? And, and that was very interesting, hearing the previous speaker, how come that such a rational decision, which everybody in his right mind would say, you never want to do something like that, how you still say, yes, I would like to do that. And so the thing is that emotion overrides the real rational considerations in the decision. Okay? The wish to be participating in this overrides the step that says, I could lose my life, or whatever else, or maybe a finger, and... and <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, the reason for this experiment was to do experiments in zero gravity. And that has zero, the lack of gravity has several aspects, effects on your life and how you behave, and how you move, and whatever. To illustrate that, I would like to quickly show a few excerpts of a crew movie that we made, and what can happen when you are up there. So, here is one. This is conservation of angular momentum. You see, when he stretches out, he turns slower, and when he crunches together, he turns faster. On the ground, you cannot show that, because gravity interferes. And so when you take gravity away, other physical effects on the ground override, forces override uh, the whole situation. Here you see he is making a, a little drop of a big drop of grape juice. And then with another straw, he is going to, uh, to drink it. But watch what happens when he starts sucking on that ball and surface tension overrides the whole process and the, and the fluid runs up the straw 
passed his finger up to his mouth. And, and one of the results of this exercise is, is to show that if you want to live in space, you have to have perfect table manners. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. Okay, next, next slide, please. Uh, this shows the difference when you want to repair something. You will see soon he starts hanging under the equipment and start making repairs above his head. Well, no problem, you have no um, gravity anymore, so it is the same. And one of the ways to say that is on the ground, people do not really live in three dimensions. They live in two dimensions. The next dimension, you want to go up, you have uh, the flat space. Um, you have the next level where you live in two dimensions. Three dimensions is, is forward and backwards, and to the left and to the left, and up and down are identical. And that is really living in three dimensions for me. Okay, here's Crystal Rose's experiment. You see from the liquid, you see the concentration sphere changing in front of the growing crystals. Crystal, and on the ground, convection driven by gravity would totally destroy this. So this is a way to really study the crystal growth from solution. Okay, enough of this. Um, within 60 years, it is absolutely amazing how fast the space experiment have changed our daily lives. And that is essentially what science is about. What does it bring to society? How does it improve society? Um, so, for example, imaging satellites for agriculture and forestation, to check that. Stationary communication satellites. We couldn't do iPads and all this cell phone stuff without them. GPS systems for navigation. Crystal growth of proteins for medical research. And that accelerated development of gas turbine engines. Velcro, all these kinds of simple things that changed our life, that communication through satellites, I call that Wi-Fi at over long, long distances. But anyhow, so what really can we expect from the space endeavor? There are basically two or three things we have to keep in mind. The most scientific exploration of space is by satellite. And as time goes by and electronics improve, these satellites can be controlled better and more efficient from the ground. Direct the experimenter, and here I control my experiments measuring whatever in space. That is very wonderful. But that are not really experiments, that are observations. For me, an experiment, say, of somebody who studies solar science, an experiment would be, let's see if we can move the Earth 5,000 kilometers further away from the sun and see if that has an effect or counteracts the warming up of the Earth. Of course, it's not going to happen, at least probably not in our lifetimes. But that would be a real experiment. That is where space, manned space flights have the reason of existence. Because when you have a real experiment where you don't really know what is going to happen, and you come before a situation not expected, you need human background and intellect and adaptability and not pure programming to sure change conditions and make it more optimized experimental situation. Now, not to forget, by the way, the humans in space, they essentially at this point are experimental animals. They call it space physiology, 
and under more names, but essentially that's what they are used for. And that is a large part, and it is important, of the presencing. And they, they measure and see a lot of things that is immediately turned back into practicing medicine on the ground. Good enough. Um, now, what do we really need for successful space experimentation? The first thing is the existence of a scientific and technological base that is able to use and do and design and ex these experiments and the, the vehicles that you need. The next thing is the coordination and the willingness for different groups to work together without hindrance, without comp too much, you know, there is competition, but not really catching things from each other. And so there must be a free flow of information. The third thing is, of course, the adequate funding, adequate budgetary support for these experiments from ID to finished experiment with data and so on uh, for decades of time periods. And what is happening recently in the space programs? First of all, where do the proper conditions exist? One, there are three regional groups on Earth. The United States, the Russian Federation, and the European Union. And together, sometimes they can come up with good results. They were able to come up with an international space station that functions and that has goals and results. And so that is what is needed to really continue good space exploration. What is the problems that we run into lately? One is the termination of the space shuttle essentially by the United States. The other one is the reliability by recent major malfunction of the Russian proton program and the two are combined, they, they are interact with each other. There is no more redundancy in systems to getting supplies and people up and down from the space station. So the, there is really a, pro a problem there. And the third one is decentralization of the European program. In other words, from what I have seen, scientific groups are being, instead of being concentrated in one or two areas, are being distributed over several areas. And, and you lose critical mass. So, and then, of course, the worldwide economic downturn that uh, makes that not so much money is available anymore. Now, what solutions can we think of that make us feel optimistic about the future of the space program? And there, I guess, at some point you have to take a real global view. And not more, we talk so much about it, but sometimes global views are not global views. The main thing that will happen is the development of commercial space services like with satellite communication, satellite. That is almost an established technology. And so we don't really need money for research and further development anymore. And the, the interest of the scientists. And perhaps we can do something with worldwide interest. For example, really start working with the Chinese uh, they have a lot of people that they can count on, they can contribute, but we really have to open up these values that you get a real 
global worldwide program to support all this and sharing of the results. Uh, by the way, the Chinese module that they are putting up and experimenting with is designed in such a way that it can couple with the space station. So they are looking already that way. And, and then another possibility perhaps is creating an office of space science and exploration within the United Nations so that there is an official statement like this is really worldwide working together. Now, here I talked about this together already, real global consideration. But what we really need is increased efforts that benefit the whole world, not just these regions that are now active. And really globality in the real sense of the word. And planet-wise space programs. Now, to close out, I want to quickly tell you a story, some advantages of going in space that you really don't count on. Many, many years ago, when you went to San Francisco airport in the hallways there, um, there were these young nubile ladies, barefooted, long robes on, with pamphlets. And they come over to you and they say, Sir, uh, would you please take part in our spiritual meetings? And, and they were very sp persistent. They wanted you to come to meetings and whatever else. And, and I always had trouble dealing with people like that. Till after I come back from space. So again, some lady comes over and she says, have you ever had an extraterrestrial experience? <laughs> uh, and I, I, I just flipped out. And I just told her, of course I have. Haven't you? Uh, you know? And she just shrunk back, you know, and, and look, looked at me like she was scared, you know. And she saw it clearly, you know, this guy is more crazy than I am. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> but, okay. The, the real bottom line, the real issue here is, is there is a good possibility she was right. Okay? See, that indeed, perhaps I'm more crazy going in space than that lady is. Okay, that's the end of my story.